Hi everyone, so welcome to lesson 34, where we're going to talk about the derivative of cosine. And this video is going to go pretty much like um, the last one, where we were talking about the derivative of sine. Where we're first going to offer the intuition behind why the derivative of cosine is what it is. And then we're going to offer something a little bit more formal to solidify it. So we'll consider this curve and try to draw the derivative curve of the cosine function. That's another copy-paste error that I'm going to have to fix before I send my notes out. But please uh, pause the video now and, and make a good attempt to draw what the derivative of cosine might look like. Okay, so moving on. Um, just like we talked about last video with the derivative of sine, every place where the tangent line would be horizontal, uh, that means the derivative is zero. And so as I'm plotting my derivative, I'll put a dot here at uh, y is equal to zero um, for my derivative curve at these maximums and minimums. Then otherwise, this function kind of looks like the sine function. So where it's increasing the most, that der derivative is going to be positive one. And where it's decreasing the most, or it's the steepest downward slope, it's going to be a negative one for the derivative. And then what I'll have to do again is I'm going to have to try to draw a smooth curve through these dots. And we'll see what it looks like um, after I really do my best to draw a smooth curve. It's already not really as smooth as I hoped, but... Um... It'll look something like this. Uh, maybe it's not that good of a wave, what I've just drawn. We could definitely use some work. A little bit lumpy over here, especially. Uh, but this is kind of what it will look like. I think all, we, all I've really done in order to generate this curve is I plotted some dots based on what I could intuit about the, the derivative or the localized slope of the blue function. And then I just connected the dots in kind of a smooth, continuous way. And now let's see how close I got to the actual derivative of the cosine function. Uh, so this blue curve is the cosine function, and then I'll, um, I'll plot the derivative of uh, cosine next to it. And I'm going to have to choose a good color so we can see the difference. And so uh, again, this blue is cosine. The green is the derivative of cosine. And I think you got pretty close if you were, uh, you know, if you got the same thing I did. And um, it turns out this derivative of cosine is the negative sine x function. So derivative of cosine is negative sine x. And we're going to see why that is. Um, well, we're going to do that right now. So in the, lesson, in the last lesson, we found that uh, the derivative of sine x is equal to cosine x. And now what we need to know is the derivative chain rule and these two trigonometric identities. And these just say that the sine and cosine functions are um, really similar to each other. But just, um, excuse me, they're um, reflected and translated. Or at least these, could, these, are, these are true in any case. And I think we talked about these in the, um, in the earlier lesson about trigonometry. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but these are relatively common and relatively simple trig identities to uh, see if you if you get on Desmos yourself and you start playing around with these functions. Okay. Now, um, let's take the derivative of both sides of this one. So take the second one and take the derivative of both sides. Apply the chain rule to the right side which means we're going to take the derivative of the outside function, which is sine, and the derivative of sine is cosine, and then keep the inside guts the same, and then we're going to multiply that by uh, the derivative of the inside function. Of course, the derivative of this constant is 0, and the derivative of negative x is negative 1, 
And that's where this negative sign comes from right here. So we have negative cosine of pi halves minus x. And now we remember this, that sine is equal to cosine of pi halves minus x. And we apply this, and we get that the derivative of cosine x is equal to negative sine x. And this is our result that we want. Okay, so I didn't put this in the lesson, but I should have, because I think this is interesting enough. Um, we're working with our result of the last lesson and this lesson. Let's uh, consider something for a moment. We have that, um, let's, let's name a function f of x and we'll define it to be sine x. Um, the first derivative, f prime of x, is going to be equal to cosine x because that's what we found last lesson. Now if we take the derivative of that first derivative, in other words, we take the second derivative of the original function, in other words, we find f double prime of x, that's going to be negative sine x because of this result right here. And then if we were to take the third derivative, or f, sorry, f triple prime of x, didn't mean to write, draw that three here, but uh, we wanna take f triple prime of x, see what that gets us. Well, we take the derivative of negative sine x, which is going to be negative cosine x. You can think of the negative sine or the minus sign there as a negative one factor, and then use derivative uh, homogeneity to ignore it while you take the derivative. Okay, and then what if I have x, sorry, f quadruple prime of f of x? Um, well, that is going to be the derivative of negative cosine x, which is actually going to be positive sine x. Now, I'll let you guess whenever I take the fifth derivative of x, which a lot of people write as f um, with a parentheses five, as in the superscript of x, uh, well, you just take the derivative of sine x again, which is cosine x. And then if you kept going, well, the sixth derivative is going to be um, negative sine x. And you've noticed a pattern, I'm sure, that if you take the one, two, three, fourth derivative of sine x, you get sine x again, and if you start from cosine, you take the one, two, three, fourth derivative of cosine, you get cosine. And it's the same for all of these. If you take the fourth derivative, you end up with the original function. And so these are um, really interesting functions because of that property. I wanna leave you with one note here though, uh, that if you have, let's see, if you have f of x is equal to 2x, um, and then you have f parentheses 1x, that's the same as f prime x, which is just 2, it's the derivative with respect to x, and then you were to take the second derivative, you could write it as f parentheses 2 of x, and that would be 0, because the derivative of a constant is 0, and then so on. Now, if you were to take f3 of x, that would be, uh, well, derivative of a constant 0 is still 0, so it would be zeros all the way down after that. On the other hand, I want you to be really particular about your notation, though, because there's, there's something that means something different um, in math which is if you were to write f2 like this without the parentheses of x, what that's implying is function composition. That's implying that you have composed f with itself and um, you're taking f of f of x, which is to say uh, you plug in f of x into f of x, so, so that'd be f of 2x, which is equal to um, 2 times 2x, which is equal to 4x. Now, if you have f3 of x, you can imagine that this is just equal to 2 to the third times x, or 8x. And if you have, you know, f to the fourth x, um, again, this is implying repeated function composition, so that would be 2 to the fourth x. And so these are different things. Make sure if you're talking about taking derivatives, you're using parentheses. And if you're um, just talking about repeated function composition, then you can use 
um, the number without parentheses, but be very careful with your notation. Okay, that's it for my ramble. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.